Yeah. Hello, everyone. May I have your attention? Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I want you to know that the program is being recorded, so I, anybody you all know, and the people that are zooming in, they have been notified as well. And so i like to introduce myself. My name is Diane Walker, and I am the branch librarian here, Hastings Branch. I've had a wonderful long um, longevity working in the libraries. I've been here for over 35 years. And so I am so excited today to have Norma. We have been talking about the creek rising and everything else. I'm from the South. And so we've had a lot of, <laughs> and we got a chance to share. But I, I wanted to, I know most of you know her, so I'm not gonna try to tell you everything about her because it's so much. And thank Jean Washington for introducing her to me. Um, I always call Jean up and say, oh, it's Black History Monday and I want you to enlighten me. And, and he said, I have someone that would definitely do that because it's always a learning experience. You're never uh, too old to learn. And so I'm still learning and it's amazing. So I just wanted to let everyone know that she has been an ardent advocate of various communities since 1967 from her work in the Black Student Union of Cal State LA and the Black Panther Party to her work with free clinics of Los Angeles and Berkeley and nonprofit community health organization. Her activism was recently commemorated in the book, which I bought a copy of and she signed, so I'm excited about that. And we will have that book in the library. I'm gonna have it processed. We don't have a copy of her book, but I, we will have one. And so um, she will present Black Panther Party strategies for organizing people around health followed by Q&A. And I have to give one more um, thank you to my son, Aubrey Walker. He's the one that did all the technology today. Um, <laughs> that Kevin Collins, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, he's in med school, so he knew, yes, yes, this is how things go full circle through history at UCLA uh, and Drew partnered with UCLA and Drew. And so when um, Kevin Collins was doing the Zoom part, Unfortunately, broke his leg. <laughs> we, I wasn't going to have the technical support that I needed to put this on, so he stepped up for to do it. So I want to thank him too. Thank you so much. Okay, thank so you. I'll turn. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, um, where? I don't need this, but I guess for recording purposes, I'll keep it on. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he's told you a little bit about me, uh, but I'd like to know who I have in the room. Do I have students here? Folks in the medical profession, including <laughs> researchers, just lo local residents and neighbors? Well, thank you. And, and educators. Okay, can't leave that out. Well, oh, thank you. Well. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're sure. <laughs> but thank, thank you for coming. And um, I, I'm going to probably power and speed through some of these uh, just in order to stay on time. A lot of times I, I'll, I'll uh, time my presentations because I tend to ramble. You can't hear. We pulled it back too far. All right, is that better? Uh, folks that are on Zoom, can somebody give us a thumbs up if they can hear all right? Okay, we'll get going then. Uh, again, thank you for coming and thank you for tuning in if you're not able to be here. Folks are coming in that I, this is my friend from the seventh grade. We've been buddies for a long time. <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right, um, I wanted to find out who was in the room. So sometimes I can tailor some of the things, some of the remarks that I make. Um, but as far as who I am, I'm the mother of four, grandmother of seven, and great-grandmother of two, wife, sister, aunt, neighbor, hopefully friend to many. I mentor quite a few uh, young people now. Um, I'm trying to step into that space and get out of so much direct service and just provide mentorship. Um, and maybe I'll get there one day. I might learn how to retire like my husband. I think I'm just fake retired right now. I grew up in uh, 
South Los Angeles and Southeast San Diego. So I, between the two places, um, my mom and dad split up. She came to LA with the kids. And so since about four years old until I was in my early 20s, I was in Los Angeles. And then I transferred up to the Oakland Bay area when I was in the party. Came back down this way, got my degrees and started to help uh, start nonprofits and community clinics and being executive leadership for those. And everything that I've done since I left the party was what I learned that the party was a springboard to my future work. Um, tell you a little bit about how I got involved with the party. I was attending Cal State LA, a good little student. You know, I'm going there, I'm gonna get my education and you know, be able to pull myself up by my bootstraps. People that are young might not know what that means, but I mean, it's, it's like you, you take what you got to, to, to make what you need kind of situation, uh, not even realizing I didn't even have any boots to put any straps in. Uh, I learned that later on. But I'm going to school. Um, I met my first husband there. He was involved in uh, the Black Power Movement. He was trying to get his footing on if he was going to be in the Nation of Islam, if he was going to discontinue with the BSA, the, the Black Student Union, the Black Student Alliance or uh, the Black Panther Party was starting up. And so he was going around them and listening to their political education classes and looking at the breakfast program. And so that's where he landed. He decided that's what he wanted to do. Well, I continued to go to school and we had a son at that time. And I, you know, I, I was doing what I thought I should be doing. But then in 1969, uh, the FBI and, and various police departments across the country started to attack our offices and uh, killed a number of our members. And he, uh, my first husband, Howard Armour, was in one of the offices. They beat him up pretty badly. He went to jail and that got my attention. Um, I started going around the office on 41st and Central that most of the news showed. And I would, I could type. I mean, we, us old folks, we learned how to type when we were 11 or 12. That was something that was stressed. If you could type, you could always get a job. And uh, so I, I went there, I started typing. When I was at Cal State LA, I was a PE major and a math minor because those were my two favorite classes in school. Uh, besides foreign language, I love that too. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna teach it. And I didn't go in that direction, uh, but when I started coming around the party and they learned that I was majoring in PE and that I had studied anatomy and physiology and kinesiology. I had more health-based experience than anybody else. So I got put in charge of the free clinic that we were opening <laughs> at the age of almost 20. So that, I mean, that just thinking back about it, you know, that it's, it, it's been phenomenal. And, and I feel I've really been blessed to have these opportunities to work in the community and learn what I've learned so much about me. I think I'm just a, a relic. Um, I'm a relic that you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm definitely a child of the 60s and the 70s um, when all the big movements were going. We think we have a light, lot now, but a lot of what's going on now was initiated or was really built upon at that time. Um, the social and political just, justice movements, uh, free speech, anti-war. We were doing the, the anti-war pro protest against Vietnam War. Uh, Black power movement, brown power movement, the brown berets, the farm workers. We worked a lot with Ceso and Dolores, with the farm workers. Um, the Peace and Freedom Party, you know, it was a time of love and peace, supposedly, uh, and a time of make love and not war. So we had the flower children and uh, the women's, we call it women's live, but the women's rights movement. Um, and so I had the opportunity to work in various nonprofit settings in, uh, when I was in the Bay Area. Well, I mentioned that I started off here with the free clinic in Los Angeles. I worked there for a few years and then I was transferred up north and I was put in charge of the clinic there. Uh, while I was in Los Angeles, I learned how to handle the, the chapter finances because the person who was the primary finance person would go to Oakland once a week to work on the newspaper. And while she was gone, someone had to collect the money from the papers and the donations and 
buy food and pay the rents and utilities and whatnot. So I learned how to do that. And when I was transferred up north, they put me in charge of the clinic there. The, the one here was Alcorn and Spongy Carter Free Clinic at 32nd and Central. And up north in Berkeley, it was the George Jackson People's Free Medical Clinic. It started off Bobby Seale Free Clinic, but then we quickly changed the name to George just after he passed away. So I, that's that's where I come out of. And I come out of another movement was the, the nonprofit movement was really, really getting big then. Um, they were only the big ones, like the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Ys and whatnot, but the community-based organizations really stepped up at that time and started uh, building nonprofits. And so that, that was where I cut my teeth. We had two nonprofits in the Black Panther Party. Uh, here I'm at one of, I'm at the clinic. I was working at the clinic in Berkeley, but we did a lot of outreach. We did a lot of community work. And I was giving this young lady a, a TB test when we used to go do the old skin test with all the needles in it. But at that time, these other clinics were coming into being. Uh, Hate ashbury where I got my first uh, alcohol and drug uh, education. They came and did, did classes at the clinic. So that was my, my first uh, introduction into that. Then here in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Free Clinic was a good partner. I think they're Saban now, they have another name. Um, and the Uma Community Clinic, I'm one of the founders for that. Um, I was working at um, one of the nonprofits I helped to form and one of our board members, a neonatologist said, you know, I'm working with these medical students over at Drew and they wanna start a, a clinic, but you know, they've gone, they've gotten all of these donations and they, Rita, Water, Rita Waters, Rita Walters, who was the city council person, found them a building and, but they don't know anything about administration. Will you go over and have a meeting with them? And so I told her, uh, yes, I would. And I met with them for 10 years. Because <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got sucked into being the, the, one of the project coordinators. I was a, a founding board treasurer and a founding board member. And I helped, I helped to write their, I wrote their 501c3 application and got it approved and wrote policies and procedures. So I, I got sucked in real good over there. But it was a wonderful group of young people and they're still, you know, still doing the kind of work that they were doing then. And they they were not even married then. They were still in medical school. Now they're married. They have one of them has a child who just graduated from medical school. I'm like, yeah, I am a relic. Uh, and the Berkeley Free Clinic was going on. That was one of our good partners uh, up north. And then all this time I'm thinking about you know, what, why, why were people so sick? You know, why, why don't we have better health care? When I was a kid, if we need, we had a doctor who was uh, on Vernon and Central, Dr. Theodore Brooks, who was, who was with Charles Drew Medical School when it first opened up. He worked there and at Martin Luther King Hospital. Um, but when we had something that was more serious or when we didn't have Medi-Cal that was active, it was off to the old County General Hospital in, in Boyle Heights, and we had to take three buses to get there. And it was like they would make everyone's appointment at eight o'clock in the morning. And when you got there, they would triage, you know, those who needed help first, and then you could be, end up leaving there at three or four o'clock, get home by dark. You take three the buses to get there, three the buses to get back home. And that's, that's the medical care that I remember from a kid. And they built... Uh, after much protests and, and, and uh, um, advocating, we got a hospital, Martin Luther King Hospital, and I was 22 then. So for all that time, you know, people were just being sick and dying for the most part, you know, even if they got to the hospital, a lot of times it's too late, no transportation, no money to catch a bus. And like Martha, uh, Dr. King says, of, of all the forms of inequality, injustice, and healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane because there's no excuse. There's just none, and especially in a country that's this wealthy, um, the folks with the money get the care. And it's not a, a healthcare system, it's a sick care, because kind of sort of sick care system because the care that you get, that's dubious as well. You gotta have an advocate when you go into these facilities, you gotta have somebody that's gonna speak up for you because when you're sick, you half the time you don't hear what the doctor is saying. But if he tells you something or gives you a diagnosis, you totally go to Zoom Zoom land and you don't hear anything else that's said. So you need to have someone there with you that's advocating it and watching out for your concerns. 
So we're asking ourselves, you know, is, is healthcare care right? Or is it a privilege? So, you know, we I'm sure all of us sitting in this room, we know that it's a right. Everyone should have access to uh, adequate health care. And so I, I was looking at this wordle, I think the young people call it, um, but looking at the, the various words that, that are showing up here and eventually I'm gonna be starting to write some things. Uh, I've been doing a, a lot of talking on panels and this, but I, I think I'm gonna write some things because I haven't seen anyone that's written about it, real specifics about what our party did other than this book, uh, Body and Soul. Um, she did a really good job, but in terms of the er internal workings and what we really did, I think I have some insight that a lot of people don't have uh, anymore. And so I'd like to document that. But I, I think I could pick out just about any one of these and write about it because of what I learned in the party and what I've been able to do since. It's, it's just, uh, and, and working in the clinics, we worked with um, really forward thinking medical students, uh, residents, a whole lot of residents, uh, nurses, lab, pharmacy techs, um, they came and volunteered their time here and in, in Oakland free. And uh, they, they taught us a lot of things, you know, a whole lot of things about medicine is not rocket science. They taught us how to do injections and draw blood uh, to, um, to do the lab work. Uh, you know, I said we were in Berkeley, you know, it was free love time. The main thing that we treated was <laughs> sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> We treated a lot of gonorrhea and some syphilis, but we learned how to do the, the, the test because the doctors weren't there all the time. We learned how to do the test um, and prepare them in the lab, send them out to the lab to be read. And then we could call the doctor and say, well, this is what this says. He says, okay, give him this many milligrams of this, blah, blah, blah. We document it when he comes in that night then he signs off on it. But I mean, I'm, I'm not even a resident. You know, I'm, I'm 22 years old. <laughs> And I know about anatomy, physiology, and kinesiology. But th those are some of the things we were able to learn. And, and I like telling this story because for a long time, I, I just forgot about it. But we learned how to do pap smears. We would practice these things on each other. So we did paps one day. We sent them out. When they came back, mine was, was abnormal. I said, oh, we didn't do this right. Let's do it again. So we send it out. Comes back, abnormal, class two, squamous with cells. And I went to my OBG and sure enough, I had early stage cervical cancer and had to have surgery. Um, and it's like, did I diagnose my own cervical cancer? <laughs> but there were a lot of instances like that. We found things out about each other that we wouldn't have known because we never would have went to a doctor to, to have that specific kind of testing. Okay, and I'm rambling, let me get on. Uh, those of you who have studied health and uh, health science or, or heard these terms, uh, social determinants of health, how many have heard that term? Okay, that is, that is uh, all of those things outside specifically the medical system that attribute to the status of our health. For instance, do we have any money? Um, what's our education and our health literacy? Uh, our access to resources, you know, is this, can you smell the meat when you walk into the market, the store in your area? Um, do you have fresh produce? Do you live on the streets? Do you have a car to get you to the doctor? Do you have money to get on the bus? Do you even know someone that might take you? Racism, discrimination, and provider knowledge. You know, I do a lot of talking with medical students and nursing students about specific uh, things that go on in, in our poor, poor and oppressed community, still I call them that, um, to help them to better understand how, how, how they might uh, interact with patients when they're working with them. To understand that just because you write a prescription doesn't mean that person's going out and buy that medication and take it. There are any number of reasons behind that. I mean. Do they have money to get it? Um, or do they have uh, insurance? Yeah, they have Medi-Cal today, but they didn't tell you that it just hadn't got corrected in your system, that they really lost their Medi-Cal because they didn't turn in all their paperwork. So they got to see you today, but when they get to the pharmacy, they're not going to be able to fill the prescription. Um, and do they trust you? I don't know you. 
I know all that stuff that you did to my people back when and, and that you're still doing. So I don't know if you give me poison or not. I mean, and people are still having those kind of headsets. So unless you're a physician, a PA, a nurse practitioner, a nurse, somebody that can can talk with them and help them to understand, you understand where they're coming from, you may not get that kind of connection with them. And so you're you're it's just frivolous that you're in the room with them. They'll just go out and continue to do what they were doing and end up one of the statistics. And also access to health care. You know, we we uh, with the Affordable Care Act. We were supposed to be ushering in integrated care, you know, medical care and behavioral health or mental health care, you know, was going to join hands and it was, we were going to do all this great work. And they're still operating in silos. Um, the crazy thing, LA County, they did spend all this money to look at how they're going to um, put health services, mental health, and public health together and call it, call it the county health agency. They don't work together well. And they don't even, all that money they spent to do that, they don't even have that anymore. Now that it, they're developing new bureaus, bureaus and whatnot. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of like mother may I, when you look at it, you know, we might've made a couple of steps forward and then we make 10 giant steps backwards. Uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so the access to, to healthcare. And this that I mentioned about sickle cell, there's so many providers that, you know, you might get half an hour lecture in your module when you get to uh, hematology to study the blood about sickle cell. But our black people are still suffering and dying and a larger, uh, the largest population after blacks now are Latinos, are Latinx. Because we have, we have a lot of uh, interblood, especially in our poor communities, you know, where the, the blacks and the browns live and, and they're having babies and they're passing on these different genetics from whatever. And there's a large piece, a uh, part of uh, Mexico on, on the East Coast where a lot of slaves were dropped off. And, you know, so a lot of Mexicans have some of these genes that we have, and that's a, the, the largest growing population with sickle cell now. So how many people in medical school are learning that? So we were addressing the structural and social drivers of health way back then, what we call the now the social determinants of health, we were looking at them and we developed programs around our 10 point platform and program. Uh, and the programs that we developed, we call our survival programs. They were, people need to be able to survive pending revolution. They need to, to, to keep living. And so our 10 point platform and program that was developed initially, um, and I can't make this larger, can I? I can't see anything. A point here. Um, this was developed when the party first started in 1966. And it was revised in 1972. Initially, and a lot of people know that we had two versions of it. The first one was strictly talking about Black people. We didn't mention any other communities. But when the revision was done, the leadership had the, the good sense to know that, OK, we're talking about all poor and oppressed people. You know, we, we think about Blacks first because that's what we are, but it doesn't mean that we think about Blacks only. And so one of the main changes during that time was that we added number six. The, we, it used to be that we wanted Black men exempt from military service. That was incorporated further down, and that was changed to be, we want education for our people was number five. Let me get to number six. We want completely free health care for all black and oppressed people. And when this when this was uh, finished and published, all of our chapters were instructed to start clinics. And so I, I had the, the opportunity to work the, with the one in Los Angeles and the one in Berkeley. We had a couple of them after 50 something years, they're still operating in their federally qualified health centers now. So that's... Uh, so they, they, they hung in there and they continue, but that I mean, that, that was our goal, but with so much interference from, you know, the police and, and informers and, you know, it was, it was just trying to stay alive every day and then get up and do the work that you do to get up to feed the children, to get up to go work at the clinic, uh, to get up to work in our legal aid program and our ambulance program and all of the other programs that we had. It was challenging, but 
that was where I focused most of my time in the party as uh, health, the Minister of Health. And then I became the Minister of Finance because mm -hmm. remember health and numbers, those are my, so that that's that's the thread that I followed all of my life. So we want completely free health care for all black and oppressed people. Okay, we got a couple of newspaper clippings here. And so we, we had our own uh, media. We didn't have Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or any of that. We had, a, a, like I said, one of our, we had a few people in Los Angeles who would go up to Oakland and work with other writers there, and they would write the articles, do the layout. So other than the, the nonprofit finance and health that I learned in the party, I learned how to do uh, graphics, graphic arts. Uh, and which I've used since to, uh, to be able to, to make money to, to help take care of my family. But something was going on, uh, and I hope uh, Dr. Marie Branch is on the, is one of these people. Um, she was an RN working at UCLA at the time I, I was uh, over the clinic in Los Angeles. And I, she's a uh, one who uh, blew the whistle on UCLA sterilizing mothers without their consent. Yeah, UCLA, our wonderful hospital. That kind of stuff back in 65 was happening. Um, this is when we started the clinic up north. It was Bobby Seale initially. And after the Affordable Care Act was passed, this is 2017, I believe, this, the date on here. Um, people started dusting off their, their 501c3 papers and whatnot, and the, the free clinic started to, to pop up again because people weren't getting what they needed. If we forgive some of my granny's duplications, you know, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> uh, and here we had our, our, one of our largest programs early on in, in health was the sickle cell anemia awareness campaign. Um, people were dying, our people were dying and, and nobody knew about how they were suffering like that. Um, and, and I, um, happened to have a community worker who came to work at the clinic who had sickle cell. And I could see when they went into crisis, you know, what kind of excruciating pain that they would be in. And even I learned from working with the Sickle Cell Foundation here, or Cayenne, Fond Cayenne Sickle Cell Foundation here in Los Angeles, that patients still go to the hospital in crisis, especially African-American males in, in their teens and early 20s, they're in all this pain and they go in and they can tell the physician which medicine's gonna work, which medicine is not. Because they've been taking these med meds, sometimes, you know, you have to change. And it's like, oh no, I'm not gonna give you that. You know, that's just drug seeking behavior. You just wanna get high. I mean, and, and so that that's more education that we have to do this so that the physicians understand that pe people are really hurting. And you wonder why we got a, a opiate epidemic going on. There's There's, no uh, uh, sending them to pain management classes or nothing like that. Just no, here, go home and take extra strength Tylenol. And those are people who, who were nodding out on the sickle cell lecture during, med during medical school because they, you, would, you would know they need something a little stronger than that at least. Um, so we did a very big sickle cell campaign. Um, and afterwards, uh, shamed Nixon into uh, putting more money into the budget. I think it was Nixon or Reagan, I can't remember which one. Um, and it was, it was still minuscule, but more money was there for sickle cell research. And so other foundations began to pop up and, and they started doing that work. And then we did less of that and more of the regular uh, healthcare. Uh, and we were on the street. It looks like she was getting a, a TB test too, but we, we did um, outreach and we did a lot of organization and doing work in the community. So, I'm not moving up. Uh-oh. Oh, we're back. Okay, we're back. This was a, a large, we called it the Black Community Survival Conference at the time, where we um, had uh, sickle cell anemia testing. Not only did we do the testing, we did the education and uh, referral to treatment. We did um, genetic counseling, you know, drawing the little chart, you know, if you, you have the, the SS and the sickle cell 
and you have the SC to trade. And if you get together with somebody, this is the chances of you having a child that will have sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait. And these and these survival uh, conferences that we had, we also provided food uh, for our ten point platform and program. We said uh, the first thing is we want freedom. Um, we want an education that teaches us the true history of this decadent American society. Uh, we want to end to the robbery by the capitalists in our black communities and our oppressed communities. Uh, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. We want an education that exposes. I mean, it, 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 we want full employment for our people. And it, it's all of those social determinants of health that we were addressing based on our 10-point platforming program. And so here, we, when we have our survival conferences, we gave out food, we did uh, medical screenings and uh, referrals and you know whatever else we, we could get together. And, and then I'll talk about politics a bit, little bit later, but we on here, it's like a vote for survival. Later, we started to, to get involved in politics. And I, this is very short. Let me see if I can get some volume on here. When he starts talking, I think you will. Oh, there we go. This is a short clip from, from that survival conference. moving to implement survival program because we're reformists and we're not saying that the survival programs are necessarily revolutionary but the survival programs are tools and institutions by which we unify our people around when we implement what we call a people's free food program we are implementing something that black people and all poor oppressed people have a right to, and that's a right to eat. And I'm a, there was a, every bag. <laughs> um, but one of our, uh, Ben Pam's dear friends, Joan Kelly, was at one of our procurement officers, and she could talk to anybody just about anything. Uh, and so, I mean, that's, and, and we had a number of people who used to be uh, uh, drug users. And so they had the gift of gab. They could go out and they could hustle. They, they could get the things that we needed because we, at that time we didn't have grants coming in. Um, later on, we actually did write a LEAA, Law, and Law Enforcement Act. We got police money to do, to do yes, we did. And that was kind of a payoff because of uh, we we brought out the vote for Brown in Oakland. So you know that that's what had that politics. You all know how they do. Scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Uh, and so we were able to get funding to do a team program at uh, at our center where the school was. We had after school programs, and uh, that paid for the people to do the, the programs. And and we were all volunteers up until then, and you know, little pieces of money started to come here and there. So we're able to pay people a little bit. But I mean, how do, how do we manage all these programs with just money coming in from the papers and from uh, donations? Well, if you had income at all, you were required to tithe. You backwards folks, you, y'all folks, y'all you, you know what tithe is. 10% <laughs> um, of whatever you brought in went to the party to take care of the programs, to buy people clothes that didn't have money coming in, to buy shoes, to pay for the, the house notes for the various facilities that we lived in. And we lived communally. We called them Panther Pass. You could have 15, 16, 20 people in the, living in the place or have the same address on their license that you had. That, that wasn't necessarily a good thing in the end for me, but that's, that, that's what happened. So, so we would have these large awareness campaigns and organizing the people. And then after we, we do these and, and we're able to take care of someone's child um, in the clinic where they couldn't get the help before, they couldn't find out what was going on. And we had the best pediatricians. We had a residence program at Children's Hospital, which was uh, just down the street from us. And they provided residents to come and do a pediatric clinic once a, once a week. And then that, that was phenomenal, learning about children's health. Um, 
And after we got started, we have all of these other foundations, and this is just a handful of uh, the, the foundations and the, the organizations that are working to uh, address uh, the needs of sickle cell populations. I don't know. Uh, enough where people were suffering. I'm sorry, I, I don't know the statistics anymore. I, I haven't kept up with it. But 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 it was significant, significant enough where I mean, you when I talk with uh, young black populations now, and and I talk about sickle cell, I ask them raise their hand. They know somebody, or if they have a trade, or, or it's always hands that go up in the room. Still, and like I said, the the Hispanic population, we start asking that question to them, more hands are going to go up because it, it hasn't gone away. As long as we continue to you know have babies with folks that. We match it up and you get the trade or the, uh, the disease. Uh, and so in wrapping up the pro, some of our programs and this book, talks about many of the programs that we have. Um, so we had uh, the free food program, Free food programs, folks know about the breakfast program. That's the most popular because before the, the government, schools weren't providing lunches. Poor kids were just going to school hungry. And then you wonder why they can't stay awake and why they can't learn. Um, so we started their free food programs. The government took that over and that's fine, except tomatoes is not food. Tomato, ketchup is not food. You know, <laughs> when you start looking at <laughs> what are you serving now, you know? Um, but we had free lunch programs, uh, especially in the, the summertime when kids were out of school. And we had the community pantries. Uh, there weren't food banks then. So we developed food pantries by getting donations from grocery stores and, and uh, other places like we have the big uh, retail, the produce downtown, where we would get donations. Uh, we had our sickle cell um, program, and we were one of the first organizations in the Bay Area to start a WIC program. The Women, Infants, and Children, that's when the money was just approved to, to start being used for that. And we work with Children's Hospital to get a WIC program set up. Um, our pantry program with the, the, and we had a free clothing program. Think about being in Chicago, no coat, it's you know minus two degrees outside and you're supposed to go to school. And mom has four kids. So we, we started uh, free clothing programs, free, free coat, free shoe programs. Uh, whatever the people came and said, you know, sure would be good if we had this. Can we do it? We, we tried to do it. So we listened to the people and we kept building on our programs. We had a, a Seniors Against the Fearful Environment. Oh, and I don't think I have a picture of that. Uh, seniors Against the Fear, Fearful Environment, it was called SAFE. And it would, we would pick up seniors when they got their checks so they could go to the bank and cash it, go to the grocery store. We'd pick them up, take them to doctor's appointments if they requested it. Because they were like, you know, I'm scared to go out there because they know I just got a check and I, they might take my money. And so we, we were able to do that with seniors. We did a lot of work around um, uh, advocacy to, to eliminate police brutality. That's what people know the party mostly for walking around with guns and leather jackets and berets. Uh, but that was about self-defense because just like you see now, people know about all these killings that happen now because of social media and the news. Remember back then, we didn't have social media. If we didn't put it on our newspaper, a lot of these things you just didn't hear about. Um, and so, no, no, uh -uh. The, the last, vestiges like between 82 and 85 and that the, you know, everything shut down after that. Um, and then said, I talk about the uh, politics uh, influences in the political arena. We decided, well, we, we've got to change some of the laws in order for some of these things to get changed. Uh, we got to do advocacy on that level. So we have uh, Bobby Rush, from Chicago who went on to, to be in the legislature in, in DC, who was a party member in Chicago. 
we have, uh, and when I was transferred up north, uh, Bobby Seale and Elaine Brown, Bobby was running for mayor and she was running for city council. And then the next uh, term, Elaine ran for mayor and, and neither one of them was successful, but, but Bobby was successful and other members were successful in going into, into politics and you know trying to, to work it from that angle. And even me, I was, <laughs> I was part of a community, uh, like a, an advisory kind of committee, but you had to get voted in for it when I was in Berkeley. And I, I was about 21, 22. Go we'll figure, anybody can run for president, so why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I showed this before, and this is mainly, you know, we addressed all of these disparities in, in some kind of way. So it was our attempt to do that. Um, and I've been able to do all these types of work because of what I learned when I was in the Black Panther Party. And my, my cry to young people and those of us who can still breathe and, and maybe you can't walk that well, but, but you can sit up and get on the phone or whatnot, make sure we're voting. Let's make sure that we're not allowing our people to be railroaded into prison because we're not on those, uh, we're not on the jury. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're doing that. And then Bunchy Carter, uh, who was uh, the, the head of our chapter here in Los Angeles before he was, he and John Huggins were murdered at UCLA. And he used to, he was a poet. And he, he was like, he was just fed up with so much that was going on, so much that was going on in the community. People were just using drugs. They're just living at their parents' house. They said, at least pay your, who was that barbershop? At least pay your mama some rent. You know, do, do something yourself. He says, do something if you only spit. So, and I still think this integrated health piece, we've really, really got to get that down because all people, all, a lot of the medical uh, symptoms are, are brought on from mental health conditions and the traumas that we've suffered in the past, individually and collectively. And uh, it's at the heart, healthcare, that, that's what I believe. And I have to give, uh, give my props to some of the fallen warriors that I work with in the clinic. Um, some of them I worked with in the clinic in Los Angeles and some worked in Berkeley. This is uh, William Elder, that's him too. He was our pharmacy guy in Berkeley. Valentine was there and he had worked uh, in other uh, party clinics and in Seattle, especially the one that was really, really super and, and much further ahead than most of us. Um, Leon Valentine Hobbs, he knew so much about medicine. And Bill Arnold, he was our lab tech. He was a student uh, going to lab, gonna be a, a lab technologist. And so he came in, but he was also a carpenter. He built our, our, our pharmacy and our lab in the Los Angeles clinic. And his wife was a nursing student. She came and worked at the clinic. She's still living, he's gone. Smitty, he was our lab tech. Uh, he was an army, um, I mean, a, he's a military, the Marines. He was, a, uh, you know, he'd come out of the, the, the Marine Corps. Doc Satchel was in Chicago. He was actually in the house with Fred Hampton when he was killed, but he ran medical services, you know, was very involved with the clinic there. He moved here at, into Oakland and I got a chance to work with him and he, I'd learned a lot from him. and. Last but not least is my Jody. She's from De from Detroit. She came to the party when she was about 16 and immediately she became my little sister. We lived together most of the time that we were there. She's like my kid's auntie, um, but she, she's gone on now too, but she's the one that we worked together to start the WIC program. And that's what we, we got. A, we got a little check for that. So I was on welfare, could get a check, but she could get a check. So we got an apartment. And so, you know, we kind of worked it out that way. But uh, that's it. Any more questions? Can we have a group left up here that could have more information? And the last thing that's come out is this one that Erica Huggins, who was head of our school and wife of John Huggins, who was a party member, one of the, the uh, leaders in the party here in Los Angeles who was killed at UCLA. 
Stephen Shames had all of these photos from way, way back when we first started the party. So she said, you know, we don't have anything really about the women. What, what about us? And so there are a lot of pictures in, in here of, of women and little stories that we've been able to write to tell about the work that we did, just to shed some light on, you know, what, what, we, what us back office people were doing uh, that folks didn't see. But a lot of it was really out front. We, we had some phenomenal women that were, were heading up different uh, operations in the party. We were at the library downtown. This other book is Body and Soul, Alondra Nelson and the Black Panther Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination. She does a really, really thorough job on that. Uh, and then I didn't bring the other one, but we have the Black Panthers where there are photos of us today. Uh, or maybe, maybe it was maybe five or six, seven years ago, but you know, more current photos. And uh, we got a chance to talk to him and little snippets are in that book as well. But there are lots of books that folks, you know, party members and, and others have written. Uh, but the, this, these, this one and this Comrade Sisters are really good table books. If you want to get one for a gift for somebody or something. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Yes. Education. Mm -hmm. so the doctors coming from Heisen Hospital. We had a, a, a coalition of health. We had uh, uh, City of Hope, uh, American Cancer Society, Franklin mm -hmm. uh, Hospital, and we would do educational programs and also testing breast cancer uh, screening. Mm -hmm. We would do uh, prostate uh, screenings and PSAs. So also uh, to uh, Colon cancer. Oh, yeah. You would come in and take that test and, and take it home. Uh huh. And you would send it in and have it set up where if there were people, once they mailed it in, we would give them the results and, and, and we would follow up with uh, some kind of treatment if they needed. Exactly. So all of that I learned by dealing with, and from with, when I first went to the, the yeah, clinic, the health clinic, a bunch of health clinic. And Health became a you know number one issue for me, and I learned that through and I like I said I put all that into practice in you know my work experience. Well, so thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing it. It's needed. It's needed. We work out. And and another uh, comrade who's no longer here, Michael Zinzum. Understand his wife is here. Yeah, he, he worked in, in, in LA a little bit, but his main work was out here in, in the San Gabriel, this is San Gabriel Valley, Pasadena, up this way. Yeah, so it, thank, thank you for continuing the work. Don't, don't just sit down now. You, you can still, <laughs> they, they won't let me sit down. So you, you. <laughs> anyone else? Yes. Which one? There have been a number. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and know that what I'm telling you is my perspective. And that's what you get on each one of these books. You know, people had different uh, positions in the party. People were in the party during different periods of time. Leadership was different. Uh, and so if, if I say something that sounds contradictory, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I'm telling you what I know to be true for my experience too. But yeah, there, there are a number of documentaries that, that have been developed. Yes, Nate. I don't know, but I can find out for you. If you give me your, if, if you just want to want to know, yeah. I'm only in the United States, but outside the United States, 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes. social media. The press, I guess the government and the press took a lot of the information and distorted it so that in the Black community as a whole, many of us did not realize that we could have gotten involved and helped. It was only after the government took these programs over and renamed them, mm -hmm. they actually started with the Black Panther Party, that I realized, oh my God, the doing that. And they told us it was bad. So yeah. there was a, from a poly political standpoint, it was um, very disheartening to know that all of the help that was started back then could have been built on by our political efforts, yeah. but in, in, instead became separated from it. Mm -hmm. And until, and it was turned into a, they're trying to take over the country type thing. And that's very, very, very sad to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and my first cousin. <laughs> yes. And I'm sorry, some of these broad questions I can't answer. I, I tell you, I was just in one of Even now, uh, you know, I talk about my experiences, and people ask me. But in terms of the, you know, nationally, the history of the party and whatnot, I I know bits and pieces. Rather than tell you something that's not true, I just, I ain't afraid to say I don't know, but I can find out if you want. <laughs> I'm still connected. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Once again, I, I can just give you my perspective because I, Granny doesn't have all the answers. <laughs> um, but uh, starting off with the history, because a lot of our young people, they didn't get it in school and they show not getting ready to get it in Florida and some places like that anymore. Uh, the, the history, helping them to, to get 
what really, really happened and, and how we got started doing the work that we did. And, and it's a whole different world. And there's so many other tools now that are accessible to young people that we didn't have. So they, they don't have to work 20 hour days in order to get a, a, a flyer out. They just get on their phone and go to Canva and blah, 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 blah. okay, here you go, granny. And, and I like the, I love working with the young people. They, they, they've taught me so much, but we've got work to do with the older people too, so that they'll be open enough and, and, and not so directive with the younger people. You, you present the information. I'm giving you what I know. You can take it, take pieces that you can use and use it. The rest of it you can throw out, but try to learn from the pitfalls that I fell into so that you don't fall into the same one. And I was talking with someone about the, the Black Lives Matter and some of these other movements where they go and lay down in the streets and, and stop traffic and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, make sure you got somebody that has some money or a house they're going to put up and bail you out of jail. Do you have a lawyer? I mean, don't go do that. Then you then you got your parents spinning, trying to take care of you. You know, We had legal aid programs. We had attorneys that would come and get us out of jail. We, we had a lot of, of, of rich celebrities and movie stars who were behind us who would help. Yeah, Jane Fonda was a big, big one. Yeah, yeah. People say what they want to say about her, but she, 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 uh, Marlon Brando, they, back, back in the day, they, they were uh, really supportive. But yeah, but I think learning the history and then working with the older people and, and maybe developing some kind of program where the, the older people can work, they're paired up with the younger people. As, as mentors, they mentor each other. Like I've had mentors, my, supposed to be my mentees, but they end up being my mentors. They taught me how to do PowerPoint. I did my own PowerPoint, you know? Tell me how. <laughs> and my buddy, we talked about uh, seniors against the fearful, fearful environment. <laughs> you wanted to tell them about that? Martin? This is Martin Gordon. You and I'm sorry, we should have been passing this around when people were asking questions. Yeah, yes, yeah, you can still walk. <laughs> okay, these things I've heard from other people too. They actually have no idea what the Black Panther Party was really about. But we had a platform that's still significant when you read it. The 10 point platform program is still significant today. What people don't understand is that we actually had programs. The senior to get the uh, fearful environment. Well, there's a huge picture of me and some seniors. It's, it's kind of iconic now walking down the stairs. But what used to happen when it was time for them to get their checks? They would go to the bank and or they would, they would go to pass their checks. And you have these gangsters of, I don't know what they call them, man, the little robbers come out and, and steal their checks, and steal their money. So one of our programs was, you know, but I think seniors. Uh, yes, that's it. <laughs> and so on that day, we take the seniors to the bank. Thank you, everybody. Before we make the change, the answer that was no. And so, in the community, you are not when you're messing with our people. You know, in our communities, whether you're the police or whether you're the gangster. And and, and so, another thing when you think about the, the program that Chase was talking about, you know, I work in the clinic. She made me work. <laughs> but uh, I, I recently did a program. I talked a little bit. By the way, um, hope you don't get mad, but in Washington, Michael Zimzi and myself and a few in Florence and Jane, they're the first free breakfast for children program to be. But the Black Panthers, he started the first free breakfast for, pro for children program, period. And what we did is we embarrassed the power structure into now what you see the free breakfast, the free lunch program, after school program, because what they said was, we were organizing the people, we were showing the people the way, and they said, people are gonna follow a black kind of party. We have got to smear them. So I, I said this on a show a while back that uh, the Black Panther Party started the first free breakfast for children program. And, and what happened in, in the 
Brother Beachy said, oh my God, I never associated the two because all I heard those black guys out there shooting guns. Let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think we could outgun the police? And no. The issue was you go in and you organize the people to realize that they can rise up and make it be powerful. You have to be put back. And that's mm -hmm. it. In the long run, they thought they put a scam, but I'm still here. He's still here. She's still here. And I can tell you, it's a whole bunch of black Panthers out there. Still. Let me get word from somebody else. And from the great Panthers, I don't know if you guys realize it, but AARP walked into that. We all have to believe that's what I'm talking Yes. Um, I'm curious if you're familiar with the Lincoln Detox uh, program. The what? The Lincoln Detox program in the Bronx. It was the party um, at some point. Was it the young there. work with the young patriots, the, the young lords, and uh huh? So they implemented. Yeah. 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 Yes, we did. And as a matter of fact, uh, Tobert, Dr. Tobert Small, who was our medical director in Berkeley, um, He's been instrument, instrumental in starting a community clinic in West Oakland, and that's one. And they do all types of alternative uh, medicine there. But we had a, a cadre of folks who went to China when I was in in Berkeley, and they they learned about all the different uh, methods for for healing outside of the wet, general Western medicine and the pharmaceutical complex, you know, of just taking pills. And they all came back with their own. Uh, uh, needles and, and different things that they were. Oh, I have a toothache, so they were. They they had the points down. They were they were helping people with their earaches and their their uh you know uh, toothaches and different things. So yeah, it it was practiced at, at many of the clinics, and I'm sure the Seattle clinic has that now. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure. Maybe one more question. I don't know what time it is. But yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Two questions. Two um, first of all, thank you so much for who you are and everything you've done, and for for being with to us. Um, two questions. One may be easy. Um, where was the party initially started? Was it Oakland, Berkeley, or LA, or was it kind of some? No, it was Oakley. Uh, Bobby and and, and uh, Huey okay. in in Oakland. That's where it started. And the second one is Mm -hmm. what, when did you all start becoming aware of possible informants and, and the heavy presence of the government was the Hoover and everybody was just... You know, because that, we, we were busy serving the people. And, and it's probably after the, the first incident when you, you recognize that, that something was wrong. And then you start looking out for that. Because we, we always... We're very careful about what we said on on the telephone. You know, even today, you know, there's certain I say, well, people are like, oh no, you know, I, somebody told me today, well, you know, I don't pay my bills on, I don't use the mobile deposit because I, I said they know everything they want to know about you already. What? You know, and and, and it, it it was, but with us, you know, you could we knew the phone was tapped because there's certain kind of click click click, yeah. you know, stuff is going on in the background, um, but. When you recognize that, that that was happening, then you start being more careful, uh, probably from early on. And, and you know, the, the, there was just a whole lot of it. There was one woman who worked at the clinic with me, and we were primitive. I don't know if you guys knew her, but she was there. And one night she walked out the back door and she never came back. And later on, you know, with you, you don't know. You 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 try to trust folks and stuff, but when they start acting funny, you start watching out for what's happening. But a lot of times, you know, actors they really good actors. They should have stepped on over to Hollywood because you you wouldn't know. They're just so well trained in what they did. You're cheating. Just the last question. Uh, 
and they discovered the foreign health book. Mm -hmm. They published that book it's called the Great Year. About foreign health, common health, which was uh, FBI Hoover on the left hand side. Yeah. It's called the Great Year. Yeah, and then the COINTELPRO book itself is just lots, lots of information. And the information that they had about you, you just never would know. I come out of the, the, the one of the party offices, I'm getting in the car. To, as soon as you stepped out into your car, you know, the cops are going to come and stop you, harass you, give you a ticket. If you had any warrants, you're going to jail. But they, they had me and the other sister, Tanya, to get out of the, the car and ask us our names, give them the license. And they look at me and they said, Oh, so you Albert are you Albert Amor's wife? I said, no, I'm his sister. So they thought I was a sister for a long time just because of the evidence that I gave them. They they knew they had they had billfolds with our pictures in it. The name and it was intimidating, but you know, you can persevere. I just want that to give a round of applause. And I want to apologize to the folks who are online that we didn't have the, the uh, not, not many. No they questions. were just compliments. Okay. They were so glad. To yeah. How did you get a copy? So we called this library and asked Diane Walker, that's me. Um, my son is going to figure out how to do it. I don't know if he'll be on the pod or how they'll do it, but he'll figure it out. How we're going to get a copy. But he was recorded. Kevin Collins was also at his house. He was also taking care of it, so we won't have it. We want to take a group picture, if it's okay with everyone. My son wanted to take a group picture of everyone. And any of uh, uh, your cousins or your people that you know that personally came to see you, I mean, everyone came to see you, but if you want to come up, you want to just take a picture. Well, and also, if you want a book, well, oh, I have five books? of these okay. if anyone wants to buy. And I'm, I got them discounted. I'm selling them for $20. They were 40 when they first came out. Uh, yeah. So if you want one, okay, so two, yeah, okay, so three, okay. <laughs> they're sold. They're gone. Okay, you get it. Okay. And this is my copy. And I want everyone to know that Pasadena Library will have one. I'm going to donate this one in and have them to put it in because we don't have one. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to come up now, oh, yeah. um, you're going to take a picture. And Catherine, are you going to take a picture? Well, the Catherine's your community leaders and, and people okay. from different members of the party, relatives, loved ones. Oh, and you, if you're interested in taking a picture, I would just love for the memorial. Okay. I guess this is. Uh, yeah. yeah. She's been very hard. Do you want me to take a picture? I have been told you to tell me the story. I don't know. It's amazing. Come on, Martin and Charles. Come on up, Charles. I didn't mention my work that I'm still doing in Rwanda right now. Uh, I do financial consulting for an NGO, uh, HIV, AIDS, and finance. Thank you for coming in.